Bienvenidos a Días y Noches del Libro, una iniciativa de la Cámara Colombiana del Libro traída a ustedes con el apoyo de la Universidad Nacional de Colombia. Entre el 23 y el 25 de abril, los lectores podrán acceder a diferentes actividades como talleres, lecturas en voz alta, presentaciones de libros, conferencias, entre otras, organizadas por editores, distribuidores y libreros. Conoce la programación completa en www.camlibro.com.co slash días y noches del libro. Te invitamos a darle me gusta y suscribirte a este canal. También recuerda compartir esta transmisión con tus amigos y familiares. Ponte cómodo porque en breve comenzaremos con este evento de días y noches del libro. Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, hoy estamos celebrando el Día Internacional del Libro, hablando con Wade Davis y su, y su libro Magdalena River of Dreams. Este evento es organizado por la Cámara Colombiana del Libro en alianza con la Embajada de Canadá en Colombia, Penguin Random House eh, US, eh, la Editorial Universidad Nacional y el Grupo Penta. Eh, la conversación será en inglés con Way y la charla estará disponible con subtítulos eh, después del 3 de mayo. So, Way, uh, thank you for your time. Um, let's start with the beginning. And I would say the beginning is that uh, very first visit to Colombia you made in 1968 when mm. you were 14 years old, right? Mm. And you tell us how you fell in love with Colombia at first sight and how from the very first moment you felt at home. Do you think it's mutual? How has Colombia treated you? Oh, it's, uh, you know, first of all, Monica, soy tan contento de estar con usted y, y todos to uh, mis compañeros colombianos. Uh, you know, I, Colombia enveloped me uh, in a protective cloak uh, of love um, and, and cariño. You know, I think, I think travelers always fall in love with the first country that gives them license to be free. And, you know, when we travel, the whole idea is to go from one place and return a different person. And in between, we kind of enter a liminal space uh, of where, where all dreams can be realized. And I, discovered that at the age of 14. My, my mother was a uh, una mujer muy humilde. You know, she was very modest, but very determined. And in 1967, actually, she told me when I was just 13 years old at that point, that Spanish was the language of the future. And she worked very hard as a secretary in a public school to raise enough money for me to join a small group of schoolboys that a teacher from my school was planning to take to Cali. And, uh, you know, we forget, Monica, um, now that we travel around the world so readily, I mean, pre-COVID, of course, um, that in the 1960s and early 70s, the majority of the world, including Canadians, Colombians, and um, North, North Americans, um, had never been in an airplane. Actually, it's very interesting a few Colombians realized that Colombia was the nation state that, como un pueblo, embraced aviation first in all the world, which is an interesting story about the rise of Avianca. But, but then it was a long way to go to South America, uh, and it, it was very exotic. And I was very fortunate because I was the youngest of the boys at 14 in the summer of 1968, And the other lads were much older, 16, uh, 17 in some cases, uh, and they were all billeted with wealthy families, uh, and they spent a, a, a summer in the sweltering heat of Cali. And I was fortunate to be um, staying with a family somewhat more modest who lived in the mountains above the city at the edge of trails that reached west to the Pacific. And whereas a lot of the other Canadian boys succumbed to lo que, como dicen en Colombia, los mamitis, you know, 
Um, I did not get homesick. In fact, I felt like I had finally found home. You know, I, I, I remember, um, I remember particularly, I had my first Nolia, and I was only 14. I didn't even know what it was to have a Nolia. But I remember distinctly being able to go and dance with her at a fiesta and then find myself in the next moment dancing with her mother. Well, Monica, in Canada, you don't do that. And it was irresistibly charismatic. And there was just something about the 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 Colombian spirit and the and the warmth and the understanding, unspoken but never forgotten, of the complexity and frailty of the human spirit. You know, it, it was a, it was a, it was it was a place free of polemics, free of bias and opinion. It, it was a place. It was a place where I would later understand that, you know, the Colombian people live as they love, and that's at full throttle. You know, no time for hesitation, no time for fear, uh, no time to look over your shoulder. Always look ahead. And, uh, and I, I found that just irresistible. And then when I returned um, four years later at the age of 20, by then I, I had um, fallen into the orbit of the legendary botanical explorer, Richard Evans Schultes, who has um, found his life in Colombia. He arrived in 1941. He stayed 12 uninterrupted years, mostly in the Amazon traveling down unknown rivers, living amongst unknown peoples, all the time enchanted by the wonder of the forest. And uh, uh, I, I, I met him. <laughs> it's a wonderful story. I, I, I met him because I was sitting in a cafe in Harvard Square and with my roommate, and we were both studying anthropology, and we were tired of just reading about Native people in books. And my roommate, there was a National Geographic map of the world right beside us and uh david looked at the map and he looked at me and he looked at the map and he pointed to the high arctic well i had to go somewhere and there must have been some memory of kali in my head at that time because i watched as my left arm rose and it hit colombia and it hit the colombian amazon and having decided to go to the colombian amazon i knocked on the door of this legendary professor for whom parts of Chiribiquete have been named. Um, and I said, I've saved up money in a logging camp. I'm, I'm, I'm from British Columbia, and I want to go to the Amazon like you did and collect plants. Well, he thought British, he loves everything English, right? And he thought British Columbia was his beloved Colombia. And so he said, well, son, when do you want to go? And two weeks later, I arrived in Bogota. And Monica, I'll never forget it. I had no plans, a one-way ticket, a promise never to go back to North America until Richard Nixon was no longer president. And I remember getting to El Dorado. I was 19. I didn't speak a word of Spanish, really. I took, I stepped onto the tarmac, and I looked at my foot, and I thought, what do I do now? And then I looked at my other foot, and it moved. And, and that's how a journey of a lifetime began. And I also remember I went to the Nacional because I had a letter from Professor Schultes for Enrique Forero, who was a very legendary Colombian botanist, a wonderful man. And I went to see Enrique, and it was like 1973 or 74. And I, um, I said, you know, I'd love to go and collect plants with you. And he said, well, we're, we're actually leaving on a trip to the Choco in five days. Um, and I said, could I go? And he said, no, lo siento tanto, tenemos huelga, y los estudiantes son tan bravo, y no podemos como trabajar con norteamericano en, 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 this, en ese momento. And I said, no, 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 I'm not American, I'm Canadian. And he said, bueno, in this caso, vamos pues. And so, and so that's how I ended up, you know, uh, in Turbo, crossing the uh, Golfo de Uruba in a fishing boat. Imagine a little bo a boy from Canada, you know, 19 years old, and you're on a fishing boat going across the Gulf of Uruba. 
and suddenly a storm comes and 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 the fishing boat is all over the place and we cling I've with one one uh, one uh, bogotano uh who had never been there and we're clinging to the mast of the ship stranded and then suddenly the sea calms and then the sun rises and suddenly I see all the lost islands of Panama, of San Blas, and I see all the beauty of a tropical continent that just goes, I was just enchanted. And I never look back. And, um, you know, I, I uh, as a, it's como una, una amiga mía me dijo, Sandra Uribe, que, que Colombia me, me regaló los, los ales para, para volar. Colombia gave me the wings to fly. Everything in my life was made possible because of Colombia. Um, in your book, uh, you also say that Colombia has been uh, long misunderstood. And when I read your book, you understand Colombia. Uh, the book is your way of understanding Colombia. Um, in what sense do you think Colombia is misunderstood by others? Well, in every way. I mean, you know, it, you know, the the the, you know, I think you know one of the things um, Monica Hemingway said that uh, anyone who says that writing is easy is either a bad writer or a liar, and I've certainly found I've written twenty three books now, and I've always found that I needed some some passion to keep me going through the difficult work of writing a book, um, and in the case of Magdalena, Historias de Colombia, or River of Dreams in English. Um, a lot of what drove me was a sense of the unfairness, the injustice, the the, the cruel um, um, cliches about a nation I love so much. Look, you know, um, yes, of course, Colombia succumbed to violence over 50 years. But during all of those years, uh, in a nation of 50 million people, there was never more than 200,000, perhaps 300,000 combatants. So... The vast majority of Colombians were innocent victims caught in the vice of war, condemned if they supported one side, inviting the rest, the, the re retribution of the other if, if, if they did, and so on. But critically, this was a war that would not have lasted a day had it not been for the fire fueled by the illicit drug trade. Mm -hmm. Without cocaine, the, the FARC and the Elena would have slipped away into history decades ago, and the murderous paracos would never have come into being. And so responsibility for Colombia's agonies, agonies that include 260,000 dead, 100,000 missing, 7 million people internally displaced, 5 million people, Colombians, who felt for their families they had to flee abroad, sometimes by choice, often by no choice. Imagine for a moment how Americans would feel if they, if Canada had patterns of drug consumption in bars and boardrooms across our country, laws that prohibited the drug that facilitated the creation of a black market criminal network, but sanctions for those laws so debile, so weak, that it did nothing to curb the trade, such that 85 million Americans were forced to flee their homes. Well, that's what happened in Colombia. And without the money, the black money, the war would not have lasted for a week. And for example, in the last year before the signing of the peace agreement during the negotiations in Havana, the FARC were down to perhaps 8,000 cadre, mostly young kids in search of a meal. But in their last year, they generated $600 million uh, through extortion and drug trafficking. And as I always say to American audiences, if you give me $600 million and the Beverly Hill Boy Scouts, I can wreak havoc in Southern California. So the point of what I was saying in Magdalena was not to deny the agonies of the last many years in Colombia, but to try to make sense of it in an empathetic way and to make the critical point that the violence and the conflict is one small aspect of a country with an extraordinarily rich history 
that for me has never been a land of violence or, or, or war, but has always been a place of colores y cariño, where incredibly the people have managed to endure 50 years of violence precisely because of their character, which is informed by a deep spirit of place and a loyalty to a landscape that creates a national soul. You know, uh, during all of those years, Colombia maintained democracy, maintained civil society, greened its cities, created millions of acres of national parks, and sought restitution with indigenous people in a way that no nation state can even begin to match. And even since the peace agreement has been signed, let's take a close look at how Colombia has acted. Of course, there's been sporadic violence for all kinds of reasons. But the bottom line is the peace agreement had something on the order of, no me recuerdo cuantos, pero unas como, no sé cuantos, condiciones, you know, and el precio fue como, ¿cuál? 45 billones, I mean, $45 billion. And right at that moment, right at that moment, the price of oil, Colombia's biggest revenue source of foreign currency, drops. And right at that time, Colombia is confronted by the biggest humanitarian crisis in the history of the Americas. And what does Colombia do? In the very months when the United States, the richest country in the world, is turning away desperate mothers and children and fathers at the Mexican border, women and men who have fled Nicaragua, Honduras, Salvador, Guatemala, because of the drug trade, a drug trade created by consumption and dislocation created by US foreign policy in the 1980s. When Mexican and Guatemalan and Honduran children are being separated from their families such that today there are 625 children lost to their families in jails at the American border. When that's going on, what does Colombia do? Does it turn away the Venezuelans? No, no. It welcomes two million refugees. It houses them, it feeds them, it sends their children to school, it gives them medical care. And now with the recent announcement from President Duque, it has given the legal right to work to two million people. I, I, I promise you in the history of the nation state, no country, in a moment of its own desperate needs for every centavo that it has to implement the peace agreement. And yet, what does Colombia do? It reaches open its arms to the Venezuelan people in their moment of need. Well, I, if that doesn't tell you something about the Colombian spirit, nothing will. Yeah, I, I, when, when I was reading the chapter about Medellin, the city of eternal spring, it, which is in the... Um, Central uh, the travel of the of the river, and you talk about the 1980s, and uh, that internationally that creates a cliche associated with Colombia. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there's still drugs and violence in Colombia, but that was like the cliche. But knowing this country as well as you do. Who, can you think in a in an accurate defining characteristic to associate with Colombia nowadays, a different one? Well, yes, I always say colores y cariño. You know, it's oh, like, yeah, yeah. It's, like <laughs> it's like it's like um, you know, it's like uh, you know, think of the mother Magdalena. You know, the, the madre creadora, como 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 uh, like the mamos say. You know. The Magdalena is a quarter of commerce. It's also the fountain of culture, the the source of poetry and prayer and music and and uh, uh, and literature. Um, uh, to me, um, you know, Colombia is a moment when a radio goes on and you suddenly see the the feet of the women beginning to turn tightly and the skirts spinning to the rhythms of cumbia and you just know you better make new plans for the day. Or it's a moment when Morita de los Manatis, this, this humble former farmer from the um, Bajo Magdalena, who as a young man fell in love with manatees. He became kind of the 
the the the the uh, the avatar of the manatees, and he used manatees as his power to face down the paracos and the gorillas who came to his community, and uh, I was with them alrededor de una cienega muy pequeño, a wetland, very small wetland um, near his home. And he told me, he always works with children, and he told me that alrededor de ese cienega tan pequeño, ellos encontraron 75 especies de mariposas. And I said, caro hombre, you know, in, uh, in all of Canada, the second biggest country in the world, we have quizás, you know, I don't know, 150, 200, no? And then he said something so Colombian and so beautiful. He said, ah, sí, pero hermano, tiene que entender que en Colombia una mariposa es solamente una flor que puede volar. Por eso tenemos tantos, you know. I mean, to me, that's like Colombia. Or how about Nueva Venecia, this beautiful floating village in the Cienega Grande de Santa Marta, which, which shines like a mirror to the heavens. Uh, and in that town, the dogs are afraid of water and the cats swim, you know, <laughs> and, and even though that, 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 um, that town suffered the terrible massacre in 2003 at the hands of the paramilitaries, the children today have been born since then, half the community. And the fathers of the community told me, you know, tell the world that Columbia is at peace. That Columbia is beautiful, you know. And and I remember I remember asking a, a, a pescador, what could what could the nation state do? This was actually a story told to me by a friend who had done some research there, and he had asked the fishermen, what could the state do to compensate the people uh, for their um, pain? And at first he said, well, we need new houses. But then he said, no, no, what's a good, we need to clean up the Cienega. No, no, wait a minute. What's the point of cleaning up the Cienega if the rivers coming into the Cienega are dirty? No, no, let's clean up. The, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. Lo que tenemos que hacer, tenemos que limpiar la Madre Magdalena. Tenemos que limpiar todo. And that's the only way that we will be compensated for um, for what we suffered. And wherever you go in Colombia, you know, you have this message to clean our soul, we must clean the river. To clean the river is to clean our soul. It's like Carlos Viva said to me, you know, you know, you know, the, the thing that the world loves about Colombia, más que todo, is la música. No? You know, they say that Colombia is the land of a thousand rhythms, yeah. mil ritmos. No, it, that's not true. Ethnomusicologists have actually found 1,025 rhythms in Colombia. And Carlos, who's a very dear friend of mine, a man I admire enormously, uh, said to me something very beautiful. He said, he said, he says, Cumbia es la madre de todos los ritmos, de toda la música, de poro, merengue, tambora, salsa. Pero la madre de Cumbia es el Rio Magdalena. The river is the mother of the music. And so, um, you know, I, I think that what we want to do is is through poetry and, and song and literature and films, we want to send a message to the world uh, mm -hmm. that Colombia is, you know, at a time when the world may be falling apart, Colombia is falling together. It's mm -hmm. still no perfect place, but it has overcome agonies that few other nations and few other peoples ever could have done. And let's never forget that the great strength of Colombia is the land, the, yeah. the, 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 the biodiversity, the beauty of every, every um, uh, forest and every stream and every river and every laguna and every cienega. No, I mean, this, this is geographically, biologically, and, and ecologically the richest place on earth. Only in Colombia can a traveler wash ashore in a coastal desert, pass through wetlands, as beautiful as the sky, reflecting the sky, yeah. uh, you know, finding a way to trails that carry through tropical forests up into the cloud forests to reach bucolic verdant valleys like the savannah of Bogota, more gentle and 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 uh, temperate than anything to be found in the old world. 
you know, and 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 only Colombia uh, is a place where there is no corner of the country more than a day removed from every known ecological formation to be found on the planet. I mean, without doubt, Colombia is the jewel of um, the Americas. Yeah, now that you mentioned that a uh, friend told you, uh, tell the world, I was thinking uh, writers usually when they sit to write after all the research and the interviews and when they have all the material, when they finally sit to write, usually they have in mind a future reader. Uh, uh, and that helps to, to the writing, like who am I talking to? Uh, in this book, do you feel you were you were speaking more to Colombians, like to give them your view of this country that you find so amazing? No, I think I think you know I I mean this whole process began so accidentally. I, you know I have to remind people that it was Anna Cano and Hector Rincon who had done this wonderful group of books called Savia Botanica, sponsored by Grupo Argos. Um, and these books had been one book on each of the five major regions of Colombia, Amazonas, Llanos, La Costa, Chocó, Correa Central. And the idea of these books was to send a message, not to be sold, but books to be gift to every library in the country, to send a message to a new generation of young people that their country wasn't a country of war and violence, but it was a country of natural history and beauty. And I think that's very, very important. Um, you know, Colombia is the only nation state that was born in the vision of a revolutionary hero whose vision defined liberty as an aspect of the beauty of the natural world. If you actually read uh, uh, the writings of Simon Bolivar, mm -hmm. he was totally influenced by Humboldt. And, and this was a great republic of nature. And, and in fact, Colombia is the one country that was born of a vision of natural history. And that's kind of fascinating because it suggests, in fact, that when we want to, for example, clean up the Magdalena, we shouldn't present it as an environmental battle or more regulation from the capital. No, it should be presented as a gesture of patriotism, of patrimony. And by the same token, if you actually read the writings of Bolivar, those who would violate the natural heritage of Colombia are no more uh, are, uh, in the same manner and with the same greed with which the Spaniards assaulted the land. You would discover that the violation of the landscape is itself effectively an act of treason, right? And I think this is sort of the great hope that 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 Colombians have realized that one of the consequences of the war is that vast regions in Colombia were off limits to industrial development. So whereas places like Ecuador made decisions 50 years ago about oil development, roads, uh, deforestation, that have really compromised the Oriente of Ecuador, Colombia now is in a position, it's been given this amazing reprieve where it can make decisions informed by science and the fantastic institutions of Colombia, Instituto von Humboldt, Sinch La Nacional, all this incredible scientific cadre of which Colombia is famous, but with an understanding of the importance of biodiversity and the power of nature, the importance of the Amazon that simply didn't exist 50 years ago. So when I was with Hector and Anna, one day, uh, I said to them very innocently, well, we've covered the land, let's do the rivers. And before we knew it, we we're going to do a book for Argos on the Rio Magdalena, which we will do. But I began to write this book, and I just got carried away. I had written 35,000 words, and I hadn't left the Macizo Colombiano, you know. And, and, but, you know, the truth is I had two audiences in, in a way. Yeah. But when I write, I never think of the audience. I think that's, you know, it's like a singer. You, you can't think of your audience because like Carlos Vivas once told me, you know, he doesn't sing the song. The song sings him. He, he's just a muse, right, for the song. So you have to focus on the book and the power. And, and, and it, for me, all my books are 
written with love. I mean, it sounds naive, um, and I'm not naive about the history of Columbia by any means. Uh, 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 but in terms of my approach to things, I always am from a place kind of of love. And and so my the two audiences for this book um, were those who maintain these dark cliches about a country of which they have no understanding, you know, the whole narcos thing. Um, but also my real audience were the Colombian people. This was my chance to give back. You know, if my, if my book, One River, que salió como El Rio in Colombia, it was kind of like a map of dreams for two generations of young Colombians unable to travel within their own country as I had been able to do in the 1970s. But as Hector Abad, my, my good friend, wrote on the back of Magdalena, Magdalena is more of a love letter to a country uh, unjustly spurned by the world. And it's my way of saying to the Colombian people, oddly enough, you know, how much, the, the, how unfairly they've been treated, how great they are. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes a people, one of, and one of the things that we forget about the war and the violence is the psychological impact. You know, Carolina Barco, when she was ambassador in Washington, was strip searched at Dulles Airport simply because she had a Colombian passport. Well, if that happens to the daughter of a president, the former minister of external affairs, the formal diplomatic representative of a nation state of 50 million people in the American capital, imagine how a young Colombian is felt. You know, since I became an honorary Colombian, I have my Colombian passport and I travel to the United States on that passport so that I can finally look my Colombian friends in the face, mm -hmm. if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. And, um, and, and I, I um, wrote, I didn't even know why I was writing Magdalena, but in the end, you know, the, the, there's a, there's a there's a wonderful little passage here, Monica, where, where, you know, I haven't mentioned also my dear friend Sandra Uribe, who is a great character in the book, but later served as my my complete professional associate, uh, associate in in cualquier cosa, in, in todas las cosas. You know, she edited the book, she helped translate the book, she helped research the book. I mean, the book is as hers as much as it is mine. And we became incredibly close friends. I mean, I always, I'm very close with the family. Um, uh, you know, I always say to her father, Jaime, that yo soy el novio de la familia Uribe, you know. And, and, and they've been so kind to me, right? And, and Tomas, her brother, uh, and, and Sandra have been very helpful in the translation process. But, you know, Sandra and I, in the course of writing the book, um, were in touch almost on a, on a daily basis, right? And sometimes it's hard to write books, you know? Uh, it's very hard. Um, and uh, after a particularly difficult day, I just sent her a quick Correo, you know? In two minutes, I just sent her something just to make her feel good and better, okay? And uh, I forgot about it completely. And then months later in Bogota, uh, a journalist asked me, um, what was it? Why do you love Colombia so much? And before I could answer, Sandra pulled up her iPhone and read the note that I wrote her that night. And I'll read it to you now, uh, because this is something I wrote in two seconds, never intending it to be read by anyone but my friend Sandra. And it was just a way of a brother patting a sister on the back and saying, Vamos a, you know, we're going to find a way out of this problem, you know. Uh, okay. uh, and so this is how, what I wrote to her. I do long for the air of Bogota, that unmistakable scent that tells me I've landed on the savanna. It's hard to explain. When I talk about loving Colombia, it's something visceral, even sensual. To be away for too long is to be on life support. To step again onto the soil of the nation is to feel instantly that very sense of belonging that so long ago gave me the freedom to envision the man I've become. 
whispered messages of a landscape unlike any other, the wild embrace of a people that allowed a vagabond boy to grow into a content and realized scholar. It is the very madness of Columbia that rescued me. Like a sweet coefficient of the soul, my fire was so bright, so all-consuming, that I came very close to self-emolition. Only Columbia could match and give purpose to my passion. I was saved by that, and this is a key if anyone wants to understand my loyalty to the country. Yeah, there is a lot of poetry in your book, like that. Uh, well, I, I think, you know, it's like Martin, my friend Martin von Hildebrand, you know, uh, Martin and I are both Irish, you know, I, I was, all my ancestors are Irish, and I think love and poetry and, and uh, literature is just comes out of our mouths. When Martin speaks, I feel like I'm hearing a poet from, from Ireland, you know, all the time. And the book, I, by the way, the, the book's dedicated to Martin. Oh. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, uh, you quoted uh, Jorge Luis Borges, one of his short stories, Ulrika, mm -hmm. uh, when a character answered the question about what means to be Colombian, and his answer is being Colombian is an act of faith. Yeah. Uh, understanding faith as believing in something that cannot be proved, what would you say is the most meaningful faith in, uh, for Colombia, it, it's it's God, it's uh, faith in the future, faith in ourselves. I'm thinking in the story of Murillo. Yeah, well, well, yeah, I mean, that's a beautiful story, isn't it? I mean, I, you know, I think, I think that, um, you know, one of the, one of the keys of the strength of the Colombian people, if I could generalize, is that, you know, there, it's kind of like a mountain that the wind cannot shake. You know, the Colombian people can endure so much and, and still be found standing on their feet. Um, <laughs> you know, you know that wonderful quote from Borges, you know, is, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, um, Columbia's always celebrated for you know, magical realism, uh, for the gift of that to American literature. But we often, we have to remember that um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez was a periodista. He was a journalist. He was an observer all of his life. He just happened to live in a land where heaven and earth come together on a regular basis to reveal glimpses of the divine. You know, you know, magic is sort of the antidote to fear, um, a, 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 an impossible landscape comes into focus through the sheer, reassuring lens of the phantasmagoric, a, a nation that has given so, a God that has given so much to the world always gets his back, you know, his piece on the back end, as we say in English. And, um, and so it's the stoic strength of Colombians that has always impressed me. And the story of Murillo, Murillo is at, in the flank of the Navarro de, de, de Ruiz. And um, um, it's one of those unbelievably beautiful Colombian mountain towns that drag you out of your bed in the middle of the night just for the joy of witnessing the dawn break over the promise of a new day. And when I was in um, uh, Murillo, I was just walking down the street and I saw this beautiful old woman, Adelpha. She was uh, actually 88 years old, as it turned out. And she was a total Gaitanista. And she told me that the day that Gaetan was assassinated, it was April 9th, 1948, no cierto? Yeah. Uh, uh, um, God left Murillo. And, uh, and violence came. And uh, then she said to me with a big smile, but then God came back. And I said, well, señora, you know, esa es una historia que, que tú tienes que contarme. You know, I got, when did God come back? Well, as you know, um, in 1985, in a terrible time in Canadian, in Colombian history, even as the M19 had taken over the uh, uh, Palacio de Justicia, killed all the people, 
the next two weeks, the rumblings of the volcano uh, erupted. And the people of Murillo were right in the path of the derumbe, you know. Um, and when a mountain like that erupts, the 35 million tons of rock and ice. And it doesn't come slowly off the mountain. It accumulates speed until it's, you know, coming roaring down the mountain. And all power was lost. And the people only had time to get to the plaza. And the priest was there praying. And then it went dark. All power was lost. Ash fell like black snow as a storm came up the valley. And by all accounts, Adelpha stood like a rock. And she had her hands on the faces of her grandchildren, reading their faces like Braille to make sure they were all at her side. And while everyone else was crying and weeping, when the priest himself was preparing people for their deaths, she was silent, stoic, alone, and strong. The absolute essence of Colombian womanhood, right? The strength of the mother. And then the miracle happened. On the far side of Murillo, there's a ridge that comes off the, the mountainside. 35 million tons of debris was deflected by that ridge and not a single person in Murillo suffered that night. And that was the night Adelpha told me that God came home to Murillo. But of course, Armero, further down the valley, was not so fortunate. And maybe it could be said that God, I don't know if God abandoned Armero that night, but certainly people died. As the, as the wave of rock and ice, three waves swept over the town and something on the order of 30,000 people died. But there were even there, there was that one child, you know, trapped in the, in the rock who slowly was dying, but she never gave up hope. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, all of, these, all of these moments that one finds um, in the Colombian... Um, experience i i just find them not just inspirational but i find them almost transcendently magical um they're 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 i feel i feel a little bit like when i growing up in canada that i was living a, in a two-dimensional world of black and white and when i discovered columbia i suddenly saw the oh. world in colors in three yeah. dimensions, in fact, in four and five and six dimensions, where everything that is happening is a reflection of something else that has happened, that, mm -hmm. that, that will happen, and everything seems just to radiate the promise of um, a new dawn. I don't know how to explain it, and it may be crazy, but it's just, it's what Columbia does to me. I used to, when I was a, when I was a young traveler, I used to believe that bliss was a, a, a real state you could achieve just by opening yourself to the world. And I, I both literally and metaphorically drank from every stream, even from tire tracks in the road. I always was sick. I had dysentery and malaria, but even that seemed part of it. These, these fevers that would rise in the evening, you know, and um, uh, I remember once in Medellin, I was leaving in, a, in, a, in una flota and, you know, from the, from the station and I, I looked beside me, and there was a floater right there, you know. And uh, there was a beautiful, beautiful old woman. And I, I just remember, I was only like a 19-year-old boy from Canada, you know, in Gringo. And I, and I just I looked at her, and I, I just put my hand out, my finger out towards her. And she put her hand out, and our fingertips touched. She must have been 80 years old. And I was just a boy from a long way away. And then the floats both began to move and they went parallel to each other for a long time with my fingertips touching hers, like roots, como raices, no? And then the flota just went apart like a wave. And then I just saw a tear in her eyes as, um, I mean, it's so beautiful, you know? And these things don't happen. They don't happen in other countries. Yeah. Yeah, uh, talking about travel, um, you're an explorer. 
you have traveled in many different ways. Uh, but this book, I know you, you, you didn't make all the travel by the water, but the, the river is the protagonist of yes, the yes. story. And I want to ask, because you quote also uh, Herman Ferro, and wow. talks about uh, roads for, for the arrieros. Oh, and yeah. His book, and and it, it's different. I think I guess it's different to explore through uh, roads than explore through river. Can you talk? Well, to yeah, you? I mean, I mean, uh, you know, Erm, he is such a wonderful man. And if any Colombian has not gone to Onda and seen the fantastic museum of of the Rio Magdalena, they they should. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, it's he's so he's very he's a wonderful guy, but he tells a wonderful story. You know, um, his father was one of the engineers that built Hirado, which is one of the few truly modern cities in Colombia. Modern in the sense it was literally founded within the lifetime of our grandparents. Mm -hmm. And he said that the whole time that the family would leave Bogota to visit his father in Hirado, no one ever told him that they were going to the valley of the river that had made possible the nation. Fue siempre como un paseo a Tierra Caliente. You know, it was always like, we're going down, but, you know, let's go down to Tierra Caliente. And it was only when he did his PhD on the uh, Caminos de Herrera, uh, um, the, 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 the mules, and um, that he realized that, that, the, that the, the river was everything. And, you know, Colombia is incredible. You know, at a time when, um, uh, when uh, you know, Bogota was being called the Athens of South America, when you had major cities, Manizales, Pereira, and of course, Medellin and Cali, all transport in Colombia went by mule. It was the only way to get from the Magdalena to the hinterland. And these trochas became like filaments. They became like, like threads that in their numbers, in their multitudes, became the fabric of the nation. You know, they, 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 um, they were like the umbilical cord that linked Bogota or Medellin to the river. Uh, you know, Medellin in 1910 exported 250,000 Panama hats. Every one went on the back of a mule. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, 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 and because of that, it was cheaper in 1950 to send a costale of café from Antioquia to London than it was to send it to Bogota. But the interesting thing about the story is uh, uh, that Armand pointed out, and another friend said, he described the Medio Magdalena as the backyard of the nation. And this is really interesting because, because if you look at a map of Colombia, the Medio Magdalena, is, it's a center, right? And the river is everything. But the truth is that all the communities on the Rio Medio Magdalena, Puerto Barreo, Puerto Wilches, uh, La Dorada, um, uh, um, Simeti, all of these towns, Barranca, all of these towns grew as ports on the Rio Magdalena. The only way that the produce of Medellin and Pereira and Manizales and the, the gold fields of Sevilla could get out of the country. And anything coming into the country also went through those ports. So from the point of view of the main metropolitan centers, the Medio Magdalena fue la frontera. From the point of view of the river, it was the center of everything. And that's one of the reasons that the Medio Magdalena became the Wild West, if you will, of Colombia. It also was very full of malaria and, and you know, it was it, it took difficult to cut down the forest and all, all of that. But but in in that sense, the 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 geography is destiny. Mm -hmm. And, and, and for Colombia, geography was everything. And let me, if I can, I, you know, when I went to, um, you know, in the same way, Monica, that, um, uh, you, you know, people up and down the river say, all the, all the musicians around El Banco. El Banco, I think, is my favorite town in Colombia. It's just, it's just magnificent. It's, el centro de, es un centro de cumbia, porque fue el, 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 el pueblo de José Barros. But it's also the center of tambora. I mean, it is like the place of rhythm, right? And uh, it, it's not as fancy as Monpos, but it's got a lot of soul, you know. 
anyway, um, uh, uh, the, the, the mus musicians all say, our music comes from the river. The people all say, to heal ourselves, we must heal the river. To heal the river is to heal ourselves. And this connection between the well-being of the Magdalena, the well-being of the people, um, and, and the process of peace is perfectly distilled in this quote from the book from our friend Herman Ferro. And he said, he said something beautiful. By chance, you know, I'll never forget the moment when I first heard that the peace agreement had been signed in Havana. By, ch uh, uh, by chance, I was at the very confluence of the Rio Cauca and the Magdalena. I was completely overwhelmed by what I can only call geographical emotion, a sense of space, as if the spirits were emerging from the earth. I stripped off my clothes and placed my head in the river. As I stood in the sun, the water dripping down my naked body, I began to weep. Rivers of tears flowed as I realized that my son could grow up in a country at peace, a river that has known every tragedy, that has carried the dead and all the misery of the nation, that has suffered along with all Colombians, a river that I love so much, and there we were by its waters, as peace came over the land. I mean, oh my God, it's just like, you know, it's, it's tan como increíble, no? Y, y, and, and, and this is the other thing. Peel back the layers of any family. Enter the past of any Colombian family. Remember the stories of any abuelo, and you will always come to the Rio Magdalena. You know, everything begins and ends with the Magdalena. And I remember Sandra was with me at Monserrate at the end of our research together. And she said to me something so incredible. He said, you know, it's funny that they named this river Magdalena because Magdalena did not, Maria Magdalena did not have a very good reputation. Yeah. And, when, and when Pope Gregory in the sixth century uh, had actually gone on record as saying that she was essentially a whore. And, uh, of course, it turns out that the Catholic Church had the wrong woman for 1,400 years. And in Christ's community, there was a repentant prostitute, but that was Mary of Bethany. And yeah. Maria Magdalena was a simple woman, a devotee of Christ. She was the most pure of all the apostles. She was with him in life, with him in death. She was the one who witnessed the resurrection. It was to her that she said, bring the story of my rebirth and ascent to God. Her very name, Magdalena, comes from Aramaic Magdala, meaning tower of strength. And it was only in 1969 that the Catholic Church removed the scarlet letter of sin from her body. And it was only in 2016 that Pope Francis finally acknowledged her as the apostle of the apostles, the one and only, the ultimate, you know, child of Christ. And, and, and the amazing thing is that all Roman Catholics, all those of Eastern Orthodox faith, all Anglicans and all Lutherans overnight went from viewing Maria Magdalena como una mujer de la noche to seeing her as a saint. And, and, and that means, you know, Three billion people changed their minds overnight. And, and then Sandra said, the, the, the river, she said it was a story of redemption. Yeah. And look at the river. The river has suffered so much, and yet the river gave us everything. Bogus and Bolivar, uh, Cumbia and, and Tambora, uh, our literature, our hopes, our prayers, our freedom, our, our, our economy, the lights that light up our cities. Why can't we do the same for the river, she said. And then, Monica, in serios, es verdad, in that very moment, a little yellow bird landed on our table, pecked at the crumbs of food, and flew off into the cloud forest. 
Yes, I wanted to finish this this uh, conversation with a question about that metaphor of the redemption of Maria Magdalena that, that Sandra told the story, and and a quote a uh, paraphrase of the ending of 100 Years of Solitude of Garcia Marquez that you use also as a second chance on earth for the Rio Magdalena. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to ask if maybe this book, this, this uh, understanding of Colombia with Magdalena as the protagonist, could be like a first step towards that redemption. Well, you know, that's really a, a wonderful and very hopeful question. You know, you asked earlier, you know, you mentioned I'm an explorer, but, you know, I, I, I had no interest in, in traveling the Magdalena from source to mouth or even from, you know, going up the river on barges. I didn't want this story to be about me. Um, you know, I, 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 a good measure of a book is how many times in English someone uses the word I. And if you take the preface out of this book, the entire rest of the 400-page book, the, the word I only appears uh, 120 times. In other words, this is not a book about me. It's a book about Colombia. That's why the, the subtitle is Historias de Colombia. You know, a very good friend of mine, um, um, uh, Juan uh, uh, Betancourt, who's a great professor of communication at AFI, but he was a journalist during the worst of the violence. And he wrote his own beautiful book about the Magdalena and traveled it. It had been his dream to travel it from source to mouth, which he did. And he was so generous, like so many Colombians were. And um, he, 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 he took off two weeks to travel with me just to turn, introduce me to people. And, um, and he described his own research in a beautiful way, uh, uh, sociology as serendipity. He would turn up in any community and just wait until he found somebody who had something to say that the world needed to hear. And that, as Hemingway said, is the essence of good storytelling. And that's what I did when I traveled with Juan, but when I traveled throughout the Cuenca. Just wait, you know, and, and that's why the book is not my book. It, the book belongs to the Colombian voices in that book. You know, um, Juan Manuel Echevarria, who spent five years documenting Las Tumbas de los Enenes, you know. Um, you know, people like William Vargas, uh, raised in La Hagua, too poor to own shoes. And yet today, he is one of Colombia's great botanists. The pescadores of, of, of Bocas de Ceniza, who, 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 who live on that spit of rocks and, and fish with kites at night with the north wind, living in shacks of bleached plywood, uh, but with in, in conscious rejection of despair, they decorate their homes with poetry, you know. The mamos who make pagamentos at the mouth of the river and at one point made ritual pilgrimages all the way to the source, you know, the memories of people not with us anymore. Um, Jose Rivera, the father, you know, the poet of, of Neva, or Gabo himself, you know, I mean, it's interesting. You know, you know, we say in English, what is life but a story? You lose the power of comprehending as you get old. And Gabo, whose life was made possible by the Magdalena in two of his most important novels, it's not just a presence or a backdrop, it's an actual character in the book. And, and he famously, you know, writes about how the river of his youth uh, within two decades had be, become this poison slurry of the dead and uh, irredeemable, beyond reach. And it seemed to me that the robber, of, without being disrespectful to the greatest Colombian writer there's ever been, it seemed to me the robber of memories is the old man uh, who denies to those coming up below him the possibility for experiencing the full range of life. I mean, the Magdalena has flowed for 3.5 million years. The presence of humanity in Colombia is a moment in time. Our knowledge in the modern era of the river doesn't even register on the on on the on the on the great clock of 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 of, of, of infinite time. And and so to you know, the truth is, I think it was Sander who first told me, or maybe it was a Juancito that the Magdalena is still an open book. It, 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 there are still millions of stories to be told, millions of children to 
be embraced, um, new dreams of a country to be found. Look, rivers, one thing we've learned, Monica, in a very hopeful way from COVID, is how resilient the earth is. Look what happened to the Rio Medellin. Because of COVID, it suddenly looked like a una quebrada de las truchas. Now, you know, it was like, and and we've seen, you know, uh, wild boar in Barcelona, the canals of Venice, the sky clearing over Kathmandu. We've seen how resilient the earth is. And look at the history, as I mentioned in the book, of the of the river of, of the Hudson River in New York, uh, mm -hmm. which in a lifetime, in my lifetime, was a industrial slurry. You could tell. Uh, you could tell what kind of car General Motors was making in its plant by the color of the river. You know, you couldn't drink the water. You couldn't eat the fish. You couldn't. Today, whales play in the River Hudson. Children frolic in its waters. Families picnic by its shores. In 1957, the Natural History Museum in London declared the River Thames biologically dead. No oxygen. It was dead. Today. There are 125 species of fish in the River Thames in London. You know, uh, dolphins and, and, and whales can be seen beneath the bridges of the city. Rivers can re be reborn so quickly. And so my dream, in a way, is that the Colombian people come together in a gesture of patriotism to restore the river, restoring the river just by stopping putting garbage into the river. That's all you have to do. And what a message. Imagine what a message to send to the world after all of Columbia's agonies and pain, after all the suffering. What a message to send that the world may be falling apart, but we are falling together. And in fact, we are giving life back to the mother that made possible the life of the country. The Magdalena is the story of Colombia. Colombia yeah. is a gift of the Magdalena. And I believe that maybe it's time for all of us, not just Colombians, but the entire international community to make a gift of the river, its own rebirth, its own regeneration as a symbol of the resurrection of the entire Colombian nation. Yes, and this book is, is indeed like the the first step because it shows uh, stories that we didn't know living here so it's it's thank you very much thank you but for your time in this interview thank you for writing the book it's it's really a very nice greeting so Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Monica, for doing this. Y lo siento que nosotros no... Bueno, I, the, quizás va a salir en inglés, pero la, la próxima vez hacemos todo en castellano. Por favor. Okay. Cuando, cuando, cuando el libro esté disponible en, en sí. español, que será pronto. Sí, puede... en junio, en julio, ¿no? Y, y quizás que podemos hacer algo juntos, ¿no? Porque... Okay. Que queremos, más que todo, tenemos que mandar un mensaje al mundo, que Colombia sí. no es un país de la violencia, de la guerra, del conflicto, de la droga. Es un país de colores y cariño sí. uh, y, y amor. Sí, me encanta bueno. el mismo. Ok, chao. Feliz día, gracias. Un abrazo, chao. Chao. Gracias por conectarte a esta transmisión de Días y Noches del Libro, una iniciativa de la Cámara Colombiana del Libro traída a ustedes con el apoyo de la Universidad Nacional de Colombia. Conoce la programación completa en www.camlibro.com.co slash Días y Noches del Libro. Recuerda seguir las redes sociales de la Cámara Colombiana del Libro, sus afiliados y la Editorial Universidad Nacional de Colombia para no perderte la programación de Días y Noches del Libro.